I see the light. What's an indication we need to start? Uh, all right, so the uh, I noticed the homework too that the DA is prepared uh, doesn't have way too much new material, which is good because this will allow me to go back and uh, uh, cover some of the little topics that um, you know we let them go basically with the anticipation that we will refer to them later on. So. Um, so I'm going to try to give you little pieces of information that maybe seem uh, disconnected, but it's all uh, relevant for uh, the bigger, basically, themes of the class. So um, I think it was on Friday we were uh, discussing uh, the exponential family, and um, we said all the good things about it. And I think I went rapidly through an application that is uh, a little bit ahead of us because we haven't really done regression problems. But in some sense, since we talked about the exponential family, this is a good time to see this topic, even if you don't get it. Okay? At least you will know it is there, and later when we do regression, you can come back to it and see that uh, somehow this is uh, a very powerful idea. Um, all right. So uh, what I want you to think, again, I am not going to do regression now because we will uh, spend uh, at least two, two weeks basically covering uh, the fundamentals of linear regression. But I want you to think that uh, you know, we're trying to fit a function in a probabilistic sense to some data x and y. So I give you x1, y1, x2, y2, etc. At uh, its x, we want to have a prediction for the value of the function. We not want to know what y is. And, and uh, in essence, rather than having one value, we're going to fit a distribution at its x. So we're looking at the conditional distribution of y given x. Okay? And I denote the mean of that distribution for a given x, some function, that's the regression function, uh, of theta transpose x, where theta are my regression parameters. Okay? So basically, x, uh, the input here I'm taking to be a high dimensional vector. It's not one dimensional only. It can be 50, 100 dimensions, whatever. So I, you know, when you do linear regression, you say, okay, I'm going to put, uh, uh, I'm going to fit something with a straight line, let's say theta transpose x, but that's not what we do. We compute theta transpose x, and then we evaluate some function f on it. Okay? And I haven't said really what the function is going to be. Uh, this is our mean. Uh, this is really the parameters we want to compute. And I denote these parameters here as C. Um, so in a simple schematic, uh, these are the parameters. This is the input. This will give you C equal to the transpose uh, X. Uh, through the function F, you get the mean uh, of the conditional distribution. And uh, the question is now, what conditional distribution should we use? And uh, because we talk about the exponential family, let's fit the exponential family of the condition distribution. Now, for the exponential family, we know, I discussed this last Friday, there is a unique map from the moments, in this case from the mean, to the canonical parameter theta that are used in the exponential family. So this mapping is defined through this function psi. And uh, so the question is, you know, to, to to get something going on with these generalized linear models, the question is, what should we use for f? And what family uh, of exponents from the exponential family should we use? What should f be and what should psi be? And how will the whole thing work like uh, so that we can have um, a unifying way to do uh, you know, uh, regression using these uh, linear models? All right, so here is the simple idea. This is the schematic again. I am going to make the following assumptions. I am going to take C and eta to be the same. Sounds weird. But uh, in addition to that, because C through F is mapped to mu, and eta through psi minus 1 is mapped to mu, I'm going to make, take this function, the regression function F, to actually be psi minus 1. And if you remember this function psi, is defined precisely from the exponential family. It's something given. Okay? So I'm going to take the regression function, 
this is the choice I'm going to make to be psi minus 1, and I'm going to take c equal to eta, okay? And uh, remember, c is the theta transpose x, okay? And uh, uh, so xi, uh, you know, xi is basically the inverse of f minus 1, the inverse uh, computed mu, all right? Uh, and because xi is equal to eta, is also psi of mu. Okay, but more or less these are the two assumptions. We make C and eta to be the same, and F is defined through the exponential family to be basically psi minus one. Now, why doing all of this? Well, obviously because something nice is gonna come out of it, right? So obviously, you can do anything you want actually in regression. You can put any function you want to, literally, okay? But let's see what's gonna happen when we do this. All right, this is a heavy duty slide has uh, lots of information, but lots of uh, very nice things are gonna come out of this slide, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do is, I am going to, uh, obviously, uh, because we work with the exponential family and, and uh, conjugate uh, priors, uh, the likelihood is going to be in the exponential family. So what you see on the first equation here is uh, the log likelihood, okay? And uh, uh, I calculate the log likelihood for a set of data x i y i. So uh, for simplicity here, x is a vector, y I take it to be scalar. All right, so I fit many inputs to one output. Okay, and I have n data points. So you can remember the exponential family. If you take logs, right? Uh, obviously, you're going to get sums of the logs of these h factors. Uh, you remember that it was an exponential that it was eta transpose the, the u minus a, all right? So this is uh, uh, this a here, and uh, u, my sufficient statistics when I look at a given point alone, is obviously the value of the function y that I observe, right? That's the only information I have. So for u, I take it to be y n. Okay, so uh, literally this equation is not very complicated if you look at the general formula, right? So what I'm doing is I apply that, I take the log likelihood, I add, uh, I evaluate it at its data point, uh, little n or little i, so put, maybe I should put this n since I have an n there, and uh, I take u to be y n, right? Uh, you remember this exponential family for the uh, log likelihood uh, we're referring to the conditional distribution of y given x. We're looking at a given x now, okay? All right, um, so this is my uh, parameter theta. This is alpha of eta, and uh, we already have made some choices that uh, uh, eta is going to be the same as xi, and xi is equal to theta transpose x. <coughs> so, um, uh, so, let me just go back to remind you, eta we said is the same as xi, and uh, xi is theta transpose x. All right? So basically the log likelihood looks at this very nice form. Uh, the parameters theta come only on this term, and, on this, uh, on the, and there's nothing there, it's only eta here, okay? Of course, eta is a function uh, of theta, so we will see how this is going to come up in the calculations. But you notice when you write the log likelihood for my data set D, this is now the sufficient statistics for the estimation of the theta. So basically all the data together are only coming on this term. <coughs> Sounds interesting actually, if you think about it, that you, know, you try to do regression and the only thing that you need to keep track here is the summation of Xn times Yn. All right, if you try to put sort of some uh, meaning to it, you know, it sounds weird, but effectively this is what you need to keep track. So x is again a vector, y is a scalar, all right? So what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna try to compute now uh, the parameters theta, right? This is, uh, so we're gonna do an MLE estimate if you like, uh, uh, because if you have the parameters theta, basically you have your regression function, you know, if you look back on this, right, if you have the parameters uh, uh, theta, you know C, so for every X, you know what the mean value is, and you know everything, okay? So we need to compute theta to allow us to do predictions of every X. So uh, we're gonna use an optimization method, 
And I wanted you to start thinking sort of uh, that everything in machine learning at the end of the day is an optimization problem, right? So we, this is the log likelihood. So we need to maximize it with respect to the parameters. So take the derivative set equal to zero, those will be the parameters. And unfortunately, we will see you cannot get these parameters uh, exactly. You're going to get sort of an iterative process, right? Because this is a nonlinear problem. It's not like theta equal to this, OK? Uh, so let's take derivatives of this with respect to theta. And the calculations are actually uh, not complicated. So I'm going to go directly to convince you that they're not complicated. Let's forget all of this, and I'm going to look directly on the answer. So let's see. The first term is yNXN. You agree with me that this comes from this term? OK, so yNXN. And then I see another term, mu n times xn. Don't look at the previous calculations. Tell me where is mu n times xn comes. The only place that I see where uh, theta will be coming is here, because eta depends on theta. So we need to take the derivatives of this with respect to theta. So how do you take derivatives with respect to theta when this is a function of theta and eta depends on theta? What you will do is the first, you will take derivatives of this with respect to eta. And you remember for the exponential family, when you take the gradient of the partition function, what do you get? The expectation, you will get the mean. And there is the mean, mu. OK? So, and then you're going to have the derivative of eta, all right, the derivative of eta with respect to theta. But eta is the same as xi. So the derivative of xi with respect to theta is xn. There it is. So if you think the gradient that is going to drive this optimization problem uh, at uh, its data point, uh, it is driven by the error if you do, right? This is the mean, but this is what you observe. And that error is what is going to drive the calculation. OK? So actually, not so, you, know, you will see this everywhere in uh, machine learning. Having this sort of an error term, all right, is, is uh, uh, it's more or less the rule, basically. Uh, when you get gradients, this is how this is coming. Some loss, uh, you know, yn minus mu n times xn. Now, uh, I am not going to do all the fine details here because they're not really relevant. I want you to only get the big picture. If I put all the data together in a matrix, my, you know, this is uh, my design matrix X, as they call it. So you can think uh, uh, you put, uh, you know, every, so x1, one, one, the first row, x2, the second row, x, and the n row. So you get x transpose times y minus mu, where y is a vector, mu is a vector. So the gradient is x transpose y minus mu in a matrix form. Uh, since we do want to do fancy optimization, we don't only want the gradient. We want actually the second derivatives. And this is what's called the Hessian. OK? And uh, so we need to compute the second derivative of this. And the only place that there is some dependence is that mu term. All right? So mu is a function of eta. OK? And I'm going to leave it like that. All right? You can. Uh, 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 from the exponential family, basically, you can uh, compute this uh, uh, directly. So the Hessian at the end of the day looks minus x transpose w times x, where w is this uh, diagonal matrix that looks like this. All right. Uh, if you have the gradient, you have the Hessian, you can do any sort of optimization problems. So if you go in your uh, Wikipedia and you say Newton's method, Really, this is the, the Newton guy, all right? The same guy that uh, is everywhere. So if you put Newton's method, basically you will see for updating these parameters or doing optimization, it's an iterative process that says theta at iteration t plus 1 uh, plus equal to theta at iteration t. And then you're going to have uh, minus, minus the, the inverse of the Hessian, all right, which is uh, so minus minus will become uh, plus inverse, and then times uh, the uh, gradient, which is x transpose y minus mu. OK? And uh, effectively, if you, you know, just do a simple uh, uh, rearrangement of the terms, 
what you get is you get an update that uh, looks very similar with uh, least squares method. It, it's practically least squares. What is new is that somehow uh, the, uh, there is this W matrix here, so it's a weighted least squares. And because the method, the right, you know, so effectively uh, you have to iterate this, this uh, uh, you know, uh, this equation to compute the parameters theta t and t convergence. It's called iterative reweighted least squares, okay? And uh, it's reweighted, not just weighted, because the weights depend on where you are. You remember the weights involve these derivatives, all right? And so these things have to be updated at each iteration. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, eta depends on theta, right? And theta is what you're, you're trying to compute. So um, uh, this technique actually, so it's universal, all right? It is universal for all uh, methods that, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, for all sort of, uh, uh, parameter estimation problems that are coming from uh, the exponential family. And uh, so you don't have to go and do this for the Gaussian, uh, you know, uh, it's sort of the same sort of idea. And um, uh, it comes out, and I don't want to go to technical details, that even if you don't do these uh, weird choices that we had here, this method still applies, where instead of actually using this Hessian, you use the expectation of the Hessian. So basically, if you don't do this uh, canonical assumptions, whatever extra terms you get, they disappear when you take expectations. So this is still very universal, OK? Uh, it's a little technical point. Uh, now, in practice, I can tell you there's something that uh, uh, if you're going to write a computer program or you're going to use something, uh, you know, uh, more sophisticated, like training a neural network, and you want to update the parameters of the neural network, etc. You know, you are doing short, obviously, some iteration like that. But actually, what you're going to do is, you are not going to put all the data together on this matrix X that we had here. You would like to do this sequentially, one data point at a time, because if the data are very expensive, you're not going to put all this in a huge matrix and try to keep inverting. You remember there's an inversion there. You're not going to do this. This is way too much money there. I mean, if this is a million dimensional, a million by a million, you don't want to invert. So actually, uh, the idea is very simple. Look at this equation here, that the gradient is the error that you do locally, y minus the mean times x, uh, and summation over all the data points. So what you're going to do is you can apply this equation sequentially uh, as follows. Uh, the error at one data point at a time, and you just plug in a parameter there, and this parameter is sort of what's called the learning rate. This is what people do to train neural networks. Okay? So that really, it is coming mathematically as a point y, uh, y, uh, wise estimate, if you like, of this uh, iteratively weighted least squares method. So you will see this equation everywhere not just in the context of uh, regression, you know, uh, I can take a classification problem, I can do anything uh, where there are parameters and I'm going to compute them with something like this, where there will be some error times uh, uh, the input vector xn, okay, and then you iterate this one data point at a time. There is no proof actually in most cases that this thing will work, but it always works, okay? It's one of those uh, uh, things. Uh, you remember, uh, you know, one of our uh, visitors for the CICS uh, seminars was saying, he started with a slide, he says, all of this is alchemy. Well, you know what? Uh, life is an alchemy. We're learning constantly, and we're behaving based on what we learned, and it seems we're still around. Okay? So something must be working with common sense. So, uh, bottom line, right? Uh, I don't want you to remember uh, everything is that somehow, if you're going to do uh, regression, uh, there is a unifying way to do this for the exponential family. Uh, and so what you do is you fit the conditional distribution with the exponential family. And um, if you do some uh, smart uh, selection of uh, the function f, okay, 
uh, based on uh, what we call a canonical response function. It comes out actually the calculations lead to very nice clause forms for the gradient, for the Hessian, and then this uh, iterative least squares algorithm comes, and uh, some point-wise version of it is uh, uh, literally um, this uh, version of what's called least mean squares uh, 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 form, basically. This is an online stochastic gradient descent, basically. Okay? That's what it is. All right. Now, this slide doesn't supposed to be there, I'm sorry to say. Uh, that's why I did not post the slides today, because I was uh, switching, uh, I was cutting and pasting. So when I finish the cutting and pasting, then I will post it. Okay, so I don't like this. Okay, so one slide came as extra slide somewhere there. Uh, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to bombard you with uh, what you may consider useless algebra. Okay, but I remind you, that in statistics is everything, it's about manipulating Gaussians. And if you think we actually have done all the manipulations of Gaussians, no, we haven't. So I need to sort of bombard you with some equations, that you don't need to remember them at all. You just need to know that they are there, and you need to know how to take them and apply them to your particular problem, OK? Uh, so these ideas will be applicable <coughs> on everything uh, that involves Gaussians. Uh, and uh, uh, and even actually it will be very useful if you, in your research, you use uh, surrogate models based on Gaussian processes. Sort of the same identical equations will be applied. So there's no way I can escape and just tell them, tell you, go and read the notes, right? We have to uh, formally at least discuss it briefly. Uh, you have to trust me that the derivations are trivial. It's just basically you need to... Uh, invest a few uh, minutes or hours to manipulate things. There is really nothing fancy. I mean, it's just it's plain algebra. Okay. So, uh, so let me uh, start. You know, with a, a multivariate Gaussian with mean mu, uh, covariant sigma. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, the vector x and I'm going to split it in two parts. One part I'm going to call it x a, and another part I'm going to call it x b just so I can start doing some algebra, all right? Uh, you can think multiple purposes of doing this, right? Because maybe in a Bayesian inference problem, let's say I give you xb, and you want to compute xa, so then you'll be saying, can I find what's the conditional distribution of xa given xb? Or you may say, I don't really care about xb. It's a dummy variable. I want to marginalize, and I want to know uh, what the marginal of xa is, all right? So, uh, so we need to be able, starting with this, all right, and also, you know, if uh, we will see the formulas when instead of the covariance we have uh, the precision matrix lambda, we need to be able to calculate these conditionals, we need to calculate the marginals and see uh, the various forms that they come in. <coughs> and just to convince you that this is sort of not just algebra, I'm going to give you two examples that sort of uh, sound, if you try to do them, the sound, wow, can you actually do this? So I am going to give you two examples uh, when we finish this. So we split the vector in two parts, A and B. And obviously, uh, this implies that immediately you split the mean to mu A and mu B, and the covariance matrix to something like that. We agree? OK? And I'm not going to put explicitly what the dimensions are, but basically once you decide that this is x A is x B, this implies the mean is split like that and the covariance split like that. And uh, the only thing I want to show, of course, this diagonal things, they are uh, symmetric. But also, uh, don't forget that sigma AA and sigma BB themselves are symmetric matrices because came, they came from a partition of a symmetric matrix. OK, this is very important, OK? So um, all right. And I, I am going to do the same thing with the precision matrix. I remind you that precision matrix is the inverse of the covariance, so you partition it like that, OK? And again, this is symmetric, this is symmetric. Now, uh, a typical mistake somebody can uh, do here is you can say lambda AA is actually sigma AA inverse. That's not the case. All right, so let me say it again. This is the partition of the precision matrix, and somebody can go and say 
this lambda a a uh, is the inverse of sigma a a, and it's like no way, Jose. Okay, because when you take the inverse of this whole thing, what you will get, you will not get sigma a a, which is a very complicated expression. Okay, so just remember that. Uh, all right. So what I'm going to try to use, and I think we sort of uh, highlighted this in, uh, uh, in passing for uh, smaller problems. We, I told you when uh, you do algebra, uh, especially with the quadratic term in the, in, the, in the exponential of the Gaussian, you have to uh, do this process of what's called completing the square, right? So either you have a, a square and you want to expand it, but in most often cases, uh, if you have some incomplete part of the square and you want to make it to look like a Gaussian. So, uh, so if we take the exponential in the Gaussian and you expand it, okay, you will get x transpose sigma minus 1x and then you will get twice x transpose sigma minus 1 mu plus the constant term that involves only mu. <coughs> so imagine the following. When we do, let's say, long algebra, and somehow we, we come up to something like uh, on the right hand side, and you have x transpose x and then linear term in x. Immediately, you have to remember that this means a Gaussian is there. And if a Gaussian is there, you say, what's the covariance? And immediately from the quadratic term, you see the inverse covariance is what connects x transpose x, right? And what is the linear term here? it is sigma minus 1 mu. So from whatever is there, you extract sigma. And from whatever it is there, uh, given sigma, you extract mu. And this is what we call closing the square. Closing the square, why? Because you notice to go from here to there, you have to add this constant term that may be missing in your calculation. Right, but the constant term is a constant. It's going to come in the normalization. It doesn't matter. What we're interested in is in x. Okay. So uh, again, if you have something like this, you don't really need to compute the constant, right? But extract immediately sigma from here and extract from there uh, mu direct. So I am going to actually use this uh, today. So I'm going to take you rapidly through these calculations. Okay. Don't try not to get a headache. It's uh, only, what is it? It's only Thursday. And there is still Friday to go. Uh, so, uh, so the calculation I'm going to start with will be to find uh, the conditional distribution of xi given xv. OK? So this is, uh, I mean, an important problem because, you know, uh, in, uh, again, in the Bayesian setting, you can say, I know what xv is. I measure those values. Tell me what the values of xA are, right? So this is very important. So how do we compute uh, uh, the probability of xA given xB? So let me just tell you in, uh, uh, before the algebra, what is the idea to compute conditionals? If something is given, you go and put that value in the distribution in the joint of xB. If xB is equal to 5, put 5. Whatever is left, that's your distribution of xA. No, so you don't have to do any sophisticated thing, right? So you, xb is given, fix it, put whatever it is, right? So it's a constant. Uh, and then look at what type of distribution xa is going to give you. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to start with the exponential in the, uh, uh, in the Gaussian, all right? So you remember, this is the, the, in, uh, in the, the, when we look in the joint distribution, this is what the exponential looks like. And you remember, this is a matrix that I partitioned it in two different ways. And one of these ways was in terms of this uh, precision matrices. All right? So imagine uh, you go sigma minus 1 is lambda. You write lambda as lambda A, A, lambda A, B, and lambda B, A, etc. And do the multiplication here, where these vectors x and mu, you also partition them in xa and xb, in a, you know, mu a and mu b. When you do all of this, this thing will expand to these four terms. It's matrix vector multiplication. They actually look like, uh, 
you know, you, um, all the, vector, the matrices being two by two, but they are block matrices, so they're not really two by two, okay? So the equations look like this, okay? And now we want to find the exponential, I mean, we want to find the distribution of xi given xb, and to do that, we have to fix xb. So let's, uh, we will, looking at this expression, if, if we fix xb, the only terms that we need to keep track are the terms that involve xa. Everything else, we throw it away. Okay, we don't care. Okay, so let's see this. If we throw everything that, uh, uh, we need to keep only the terms that involve xa. So this is one term, and immediately you can see a quadratic, all right? And then there's another linear term that involves xb. I cannot throw xb here, right? It's a constant. I cannot get rid of this because there is an xa there that multiplies it. So, uh, and then um, uh, I have similarly here xa, and there is, this is constant. And this term, obviously, it's irrelevant, so we can get rid of the last term. So can you tell me now, uh, close the square on xa, and tell me uh, from where I am going to be able to compute the covariance that defines the, the distribution of xa given xb. So I need to, to look at all the terms that involve x transpose, xa transpose, something times xa. All right, I see there is one term there. Is there any other term that involves xa transpose xa? I don't see anything. So really, what I have here is uh, one half xa transpose lambda aa xa. So the, uh, the covariance in the condition distribution that I'm looking is really lambda aa inverse. Now you may say, why are you, you going from uh, covariances to the precisions? Well, the reason is because the algebra is simple. If I, I was going to try to write this in terms of the partition of the sigma matrix, you know, it will, the algebra would be looking, this will not be simple lambda A inverse, but it will be looking some uh, more complicated expression. And I'm going to give it to you soon, actually, because you may, uh, it may be of interest to you. Maybe you don't want to, in, to compute lambda. You want to do this in terms of sigma. But uh, the easy expression is, that the conditional, uh, the, the covariance for the conditional distribution is lambda A inverse. And then, how do we get the linear term? You remember the linear term? Uh, what we need to do is we have to find everything that is linear in XA. And you notice there is, if you multiply the XA transpose with uh, lambda A mu A, that's a linear term, all right? And then what else we have? Uh, this is a linear term, all right? Uh, so lambda a b x b minus mu b times uh, x a transpose, that's a linear term. And effectively, how uh, we recognize the mean now of the conditional x transpose. So this is supposed to be, you know what? The inverse of the covariance of the, uh, of the conditional times the mean of the conditional. And, and it has to be equal to this. All right? So uh, what is the mean? What is the inverse of this? The inverse of that is lambda AA. So I really have to multiply this with lambda AA inverse. So this will cancel, then I get like that. And this is the final answer that from now on you will need to use all the time when you partition Gaussians. And really you need to write those in a piece of paper on your notebook on first page because these are formulas that you will need to know uh, where to find them so you can use them without much thinking, okay? So if you partition again, x to xa and xb, uh, the uh, covariance has a very simple uh, form. If you write it in, uh, in terms of the partition precision, so it is the matrix lambda a inverse, okay? And the mean, slightly more complicated, that looks like that. Uh, uh, it's interesting actually to know to notice here, the mean, it's linear in xb, all right? But you notice the covariance doesn't depend on xb. That's an interesting fact, right? So if you want to compute the condition of xa given xb, but somehow uh, the value of xb does not affect the covariance, you know? Uh, so it does not affect basically your uncertainty, your predictions on xa, okay? Uh, but the mean comes to be a linear 
a function of xb, so it looks like that. All right. Uh, more algebra, all right? And again, uh, trust me that this is sort of, uh, these formulas are extremely fundamental. Um, I can tell you if you take a typical book in machine learning, uh, this formulas must be used overall maybe a thousand times on a tip one textbook, basically, okay? So it's not something you take in passing, you say, okay, just, you have to know exactly what these formulas are. So, uh, Let's go away a little bit from Gaussians, uh, so I can give you uh, uh, an inversion partition theorem. So if you have a matrix that's partitioned as A, B, C, D, uh, you can, uh, uh, in, you are interested from in the inverse of this, okay? Uh, you are going to, you can use what is called the sure complement of uh, the matrix D, okay? And easy way to think of the sure complement, this matrix M, you look, so this is diagonal, okay? You start from the opposite side, and it is A minus B, D minus C, okay? A minus B, D minus C, okay? So this is the sure complement of the matrix D. So this partition theorem says basically, to invert this matrix uh, A, B, C, D, that's partition like that, uh, this is how the inverse matrix looks like. Now, you may say, why do I care about these inverse matrices? Well, unfortunately, all processes, especially like when you try to do uh, Gaussian process modeling, uh, uh, you know, you will find out that these matrices to be inverted, and you will need to invert them to do predictions, are extremely expensive, these calculations. Extremely expensive. So now, uh, maybe this uh, other matrices that you see here, the cost of computing these inverses is way less than inverting this your standard way. Maybe. And I'm going to give you an example. Actually, for you will see immediately that you can do this inversion uh, uh, very cheaply. Unfortunately, you cannot do this all the time, right? But if you can and you don't do it, uh, basically you're in trouble. All right, so, uh, so this is uh, this uh, inversion formula. And uh, uh, the proof is actually, I'm not going to go through it, okay? It, it's basically two operations. Uh, one, uh, you make this, you multiply by this, you make it a lower um, uh, triang block triangular. Uh, then you multiply uh, on the right with this matrix, you make it a, a block diagonal, you put the whole, the whole thing together, and this is what you get in one page, okay? Uh, nothing really uh, very fancy. You can do this, uh, uh, you know, you can do this uh, 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 inversion formula where you use now the sure complement of matrix A, and in the same definition as before, you look on the other side, it will be D minus C, A minus 1, B. So basically the same formula is applied, okay? Um, it's a permutation, if you like, of the symbols that we used uh, uh, before. Now, uh, so if you uh, use the sure complement, the first derivation, this inverse looks like this. If you use the sure complement for the matrix A, uh, it looks like this. Obviously, the two results have to be the same. And immediately, you uh, come up with a very famous uh, formula that this blue term has to be equal to this blue term. And this gives you this equation, which goes in the literature as the Woodbury formula. Okay. And uh, very, very fundamental, basically, on uh, everything with Gaussians, okay? Because you notice here, in its general form, if you want to invert uh, this, okay, uh, it basically, it becomes an inversion of uh, D minus C, A minus 1, B. Uh, and maybe, with some luck, maybe, uh, in your problem, Inverting this matrix is way cheaper than inverting that matrix, okay? Uh, so, um, we will see an application in one second. And similarly, you can take this red uh, term equal to that red term, and you come uh, with another equation that looks like this. And uh, if you take the determinants of this, this equation actually is also extremely handy, okay, in, in algebra. So basically, you just take the determinants of this on both sides, and you come up. So this, this uh, vertical lines imply determinants. 
So let me give you an example of why you need to care if you are really interested in machine learning and playing with data, why you care about the Woodbury formula. So let's, uh, uh, th so this is the Woodbury formula written uh, again here. And so let's do the following thing. Let's consider that the matrix A is uh, sigma. And literally what I mean sigma is, is really the covariance matrix, okay? Uh, that you need to invert to do predictions uh, as we will see later in the course. Uh, and let this covariance matrix is n by n. So n is, uh, let's say, how many data points you have, okay? And these data points, you know, uh, uh, you know, they can be actually, let's say, in, in uh, d dimensions, okay? So, uh, all right, so what uh, you want to be able to do is, so now, uh, let me take some particular choices of the matrices B and C. Uh, so I'm gonna set, take, set B equal to C transpose to be equal to some matrix X that is of size N by D, where D is way smaller than N. Right? So I'm going to take, uh, again, an application of this formula. We set A equal to sigma n by n, and we set B and C to be B and C transpose to be equal to x, where this is n times d, where d is way smaller than n. Okay? And we're going to set this d minus 1 to be an identity matrix with a minus sign. Okay? Just so I can work the signs properly. So if you plug in this A, this B, this C, and this D, this is how this formula looks like. And uh, I remind you, A and C are n by n. So this whole matrix here, all right, sigma plus x, x transpose, is an n by n matrix. And this matrix that you need to invert here is D by D. And D is way smaller than n, OK? So you can. Uh, uh, I don't want to give you the specifics of this, right? But you can think if uh, uh, sigma maybe is your prior covariance, all right? And uh, x is the contribution that you get. Uh, x is your what is called the design matrix that involves the data points that you collected, okay? So basically now your new covariance is this, and this is what you need to invert, okay? Now to invert this is extremely expensive. If you have a million data points, this is a, a million by million. Cannot do it. But if the problem is five dimensions, in five dimensions only, the matrix actually that you need to invert, it's five by five. Okay? So uh, this formula comes very handy, as I said, in uh, Gaussian processes. It reduces the cost from uh, uh, n cube calculations to d cube. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, life, nothing is very general, right? You're not applied all the time in all problems of interest. It's not like any inversion, you can reduce the cost. But with Gaussians, it works. Okay? That's why the Woodbury formula is uh, very fundamental to, to machine learning. And I'm going to give you actually uh, a, another version of the uh, Woodbury formula that uh, uh, if you, let's say, you do online learning, and you want to, to compute and do predictions one data point at a time. So rather than forming this, taking all the input, all the data and putting them on this matrix, this design matrix X, what you can do is, you know, you treat one data point at a time. And in that case, actually, what you have here to invert is uh, A or sigma that we had before, plus a vector U V transpose. It's a rank one update, as they call it. So rather than having the matrix x, x transpose, is a matrix defined by these vectors u and v. And it comes out, actually, uh, that uh, in, you know, inverting this, look at this calculation, right? The idea is we have the inverse of A, right? We're adding now uh, u, v transpose. If you look at the calculation here, you don't really have to invert anything. Okay, so there is a merit to be able to do this thing online because you avoid basically a very heavy duty calculation. Okay, uh, notice this thing here is a scalar. Okay, this is a scalar. So this way, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're able basically to work with these rank one updates, uh, one data point at a time, and you don't have to do uh, this massive uh, uh, inversions. This formula is, has 
infinite applications, basically in other scientific uh, domains, but you know, uh, we're interested to use it in the context of uh, uh, Gaussians. All right. Um, uh, so if you remember, I, I gave you before uh, the conditional distribution, and I express everything in terms of lambda. Right? I express everything in terms of lambda. Okay? So you may say, but I don't want lambda. I want to, even if the formulas are complicated, I want to be able to actually compute this in, uh, in, uh, in terms of sigma. Well, so, you know, the algebra is going to get messy because you remember the general inversion formulas say uh, one of them equals A, B, C, D inverse equal to this. Okay? So if you want uh, to uh, express the precision matrices in your partition in terms of the partitions in the covariance, basically this is the inverse of that and the inverse of this is going to be computed with this complicated formula. So if you really want to know what lambda A, A is in the conditional matrix, it's really this whole thing here. If you want to know what lambda A, B is, is equal to this thing. So sometimes the formulas are easier to express them in terms of precision rather than of sigma. But keep in mind, you know, uh, if you only have sigma and you don't want to invert it to get lambda, uh, basically this, these formulas are already uh, available for you. All right, I am not going to uh, give you uh, the derivation because really it's a simple algebra. So I'm only going to write that the condition distribution, if you want to write in terms of sigma, not lambda, basically these are the answers, all right? So they look, you know, the mean doesn't look very complicated, you know, it's only that the covariance, uh, it looks slightly more complicated, okay. Um, I am not going to do the marginal distribution now, but can you tell me what is the procedure that, uh, if I ask you, I have this Gaussian, I partition X in XA and XB, and I want to find the marginal of XA. Can you tell me what are you going to do to get this marginal? Before you remember when we were interested in the conditional, we said fix XB and look only on XA. Now I want only XA, I want the marginal. Marginal implies what do I need to do to XB? Integrate it out. So what do you need to do is, here's the idea, right? You, you need to look at the terms that involve XB only and see if you can make a Gaussian out of, that, of those terms. And if you make a Gaussian, then you know what? You can integrate it out without doing any calculations because it's a Gaussian. So you integrate, you say I'm getting a one. Okay? So uh, if you expand the square exponential again, uh, and I am doing this in, in terms of precision, you notice if you concentrate on XB, you do get a Gaussian. Can you see that? Do you see that, you know, if you, exp if you look at this term and you look at all terms that involve XB, all right, this is a square, all right, XB transpose XB, and this is the linear part, okay? So obviously, if I go and add some constant term, I can make this be the exponential of some Gaussian in XB, all right? Now, the, the, uh, things are a little bit tricky because before, uh, we didn't really care about the constant term here, but this constant term that we need to add to close the square, it may be a function of XA. And because we're interested in the margin distribution of XA, we cannot just go and say, yes, and make this, uh, you know, uh, to close the square, but I don't really care about this term because if you add something that depends on XA, you also have to do what? Subtract it as well. So you add it and all of this will give you uh, a Gaussian that disappears and then you are left with a term that you add it. When you do all of these things and uh, you come up with the following simple answer uh, that I think we use it in our derivations, that the marginal of XA if you express in terms of the covariance of the sigma, it's really mu a, the mean is mu a, and uh, the covariance sigma a a. Very simple formula. So when uh, you partition the, the, uh, the covariance and, and the mean, uh, these partitions of the values of mu a and sigma a a already define the margin. You don't have to do any algebra. Okay? 
So uh, again, actually, this slide here summarizes everything that you need to know. Okay. So this is uh, how the margins look like, and this is how the uh, uh, conditions look like. Remember, marginals means you integrated XB out. Remember, condition means XB, you fix it to one value that is given, and you look at the distribution of XA. All right, if you try to do this uh, in, a, uh, in a simple uh, uh, bivariate Gaussian, and I use the correlation coefficient here, I think we have seen this formula, so the marginal basically of X1 will have uh, mean mu1 and covariance sigma uh, variance sigma 1 square and if you use the general formulas and actually this would be a good exercise right the general formulas involve matrices but if you try to use this for scalars here you come up that the uh, condition of x1 given x2 is given like this okay and uh, and I think uh, I had shown to you these plots before on uh, how these conditions and marginals look for Gaussian all right, so let me, I'm going to do two applications. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, maybe not the correct way, right? But hopefully we can make some connections with these formulas of, uh, of uh, the partition in the Gaussian and computing conditions and the likes. So, uh, so let's uh, try to interpolate, to interpolate uh, what I call noise-free data. So let's, this is a 1D interpolation. So you uh, give me, uh, so the input is uh, the horizontal axis, let's say, is the T values and the vertical axis are the Y values. So you basically want me to interpolate, all right? And, and you give me, for some inputs, Ti. You give me what the output is, and that's the exact output, there's no noise. And you, you give me this information for endpoints, and you tell me interpolate in between, right? I mean, this is obviously a mathematical problem. Uh, by the way, the word interpolation in a Bayesian setting is prohibited. It's bad for you. You don't interpolate ever. OK? And you will see this when we talk about Bayesian things. You don't interpolate. OK? Uh, the idea is not how to interpolate, but how to actually do predictions. Very much different uh, things. But right now, we want to make an application here, and we, so we, you know, if we have these endpoints, we want somehow uh, to fit uh, uh, a function, basically, so we can do uh, a sort of uh, uh, interpolation in between these points, okay? So uh, what we want to do is, right, we, uh, we want to put, uh, uh, so we, we want to compute this function f, and uh, we're going to be slightly probabilistic. So what we want to do is we want, um, uh, rather than fitting one function, to put the distribution of our functions. So I'm literally now, I am running ahead to another course that where hopefully I, you know, unless they assign me something else weird, I'm going to be teaching in the spring on, on uh, Gaussian processes <coughs> and similar topics. But we want... Basically, when you try to fit something right, uh, the idea in, in, uh, is that not a un one function does the job. It's a distribution of the functions that will do the right job. So what we want to do is we want to put a prior over this function set. And I'm going to do this in a sort of trivial way that uh, without much sort of uh, depth. Okay. So let's see what I mean. Uh, uh, you know. So we. So. You know, think uh, a one line where, you know, at some points you give me, at uh, uh, D points you give me what the values of the response is. So, um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I am going to, so I don't know why I changed the notation here. I went from Y, okay, maybe this needs to be corrected, okay. So X is my, the, my function response, okay. Uh, so it's confusing, I apologize. So what I'm going to do is I am going to assume that my function varies, you know, think of the, of uh, when I do interpolation, think that uh, I interpolate on intervals del delta t, okay? So you have a nice grid in the x horizontal axis, right? And you look what the responses are. So you, you want functions that somehow will give you responses 
where at the point j, the response is the average of the response at j minus 1 and j. And this is what I call a smooth prior. We want basically a response that it will not suddenly take us from one value to something extremely different, OK? So we want basically the response at point j to be an average of the response at j minus 1 and j plus 1 plus some noise. Okay, I mean, we're not basically 100% that is accurate, so we're going to put some noise and we're going to make that noise a Gaussian, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, so lambda here will be the, the precision. Uh, and, uh, okay? And uh, so if you write this in a matrix form, all right, uh, you can put all of this together in a matrix that looks like this, okay? And, uh, 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 and uh, so let me summarize it on the next slide. So effectively, if you, so if, you, if you write this equation right for every point okay, that you have, uh, and you put all of this in a matrix form using this matrix cell, uh, all the points together would be that LX follows a Gaussian uh, with mean 0 and precision uh, lambda, right? Uh, come on. You notice from here, if I put all of this together, uh, what I'm going to get is L times the vector X of all my responses, and this is uh, my, my noise epsilon, okay? So uh, LX follows this Gaussian, and you may forgot this, but uh, if uh, uh, you remember somewhere I gave you transformation, if X is a Gaussian, I told you how AX, uh, uh, AX will also be a Gaussian, and you remember the mean will be A times the mean of uh, X, and the covariance would be A, A transpose. So now here we have to do the reverse. I give you LX to be a Gaussian, and I want the probability of X. So it's actually going to look like this. So instead of uh, uh, you know, using uh, uh, L, we have to use L minus 1. right? And actually, you have to put L transpose L together, because L is not invertible. Okay. So what you see here is, and again, even if the previous discussion with uh, this smooth interpolation and the assumption doesn't make any sense, this prior that you see like this, it's called the smooth prior. So if basically you want to compute the, a function where uh, the responses from point to point don't vary very much, all right, this is a smooth function where this metric cell uh, looks <coughs> like uh, you know, you may remember from your high school or uh, calculus courses, this looks like a discretization of second derivatives. You remember when you take uh, second derivatives and you discretize with finite difference on a grid? Okay, all right. Uh, so effectively, uh, this is sort of penalizes uh, big variations based on, on uh, on uh, those derivatives, okay? Sort of, it's uh, equivalent, if you like, to regularization. So, uh, okay, so this, you know, the response, we put it to be a smooth prior like that. Now, uh, the problem, uh, let's go back to the original problem, right? When I wrote this, I involved all the points uh, on the grid, but I'm only giving you the function values at some points, and I want you to interpolate at the other points. So immediately, can you see, if my prior here is a Gaussian, all right, this is really a Gaussian, uh, effectively what I need to do is I want to partition x on what I don't know and what I know. Can you see that? Before we had xa and xb, now literally make xb the value functions that I gave you, and then you have to compute what is xa, okay? And effectively what we need to do is uh, take this, um, uh, uh, take this uh, covariance that you have there, do the partition exactly as we did in the, you know, in, uh, uh, in the general formulas. And, uh, and uh, uh, so this is how the partition will look like. And then use the results that we had for uh, the probability of xa given xb. And you say here is the mean, and here is the covariance. You write down the formulas, and you're done. And you can see that the covariance doesn't depend on uh, the values of x2 that you're given. The mean depends uh, on x2. And I only want to show you how the results look like. This is sort of uh, a, a way to think 
on how we're go actually going to do some simple Gaussian uh, process modeling later in the course, okay? So uh, this is my x-axis or s-axis, whatever I call it. Uh, this, I give you the values of the, of the function at these points. Um, and um, so what do you think this uh, uh, highlighted uh, region is? Don't pay attention to the little uh, wiggly lines. But do you think, what do you think these uh, regions are? Uh, well, it's no data, but uh, uh, it shows that it's so big, right, or so small. What is actually that plot showing? Because at the end of the day, the, the conditional distribution is a Gaussian, right, that we computed, all right? So what does it show me? Plus minus one standard deviation, literally, okay? So this is the predictive variance, if you like, in the calculations, all right? And obviously, if you're away of the, from the data, as you said, your predictions allow you. It says, you know what? Sorry, this is the best I can do. OK? Uh, so that's one thing. And uh, uh, so these error bars are really plus minus, OK, uh, the uh, one standard deviation. I mean, you actually take the diagrams of the covariance matrix. Uh, and what do you think these weekly lines are? You remember, you know, the idea here is, we said, not one function will do the job. It's P of X gives you a distribution. So if I look be from before, right, I compute P of X1 given X2. You know what that means? I can take that Gaussian and say now sample at all the points I don't know. There is one value. And then sample again, another value. And if I plot all of these things, I get all of these weekly lines. So these are realizations coming from that Gaussian, OK? And uh, now, obviously, if you average over all these possible realizations, you get actually this mean that looks very small. But actually, in, in a Bayesian setting, we're not really interested in the mean, because the mean may not be representative of what's going on, OK? Uh, so we're really interested on, uh, obviously, the error bars, but the error bars don't capture uh, everything. So these realizations that you see here are extremely important to do sort of sophisticated analysis on uh, uh, on this type of problems. All right. So uh, I'm going to come back on this type of settings. Right. So I'm throwing to you this as an application of uh, of why these conditional Gaussians are important. Okay. And we use them here to do uh, interpolation. Uh, using what is called a smooth prior that looks like that. Uh, but the way if any of you is working on imaging, right, these are the priors you use. So if you try to reconstruct an image from some noisy version of it, you're going to put a prior on the pixels that basically will say, you know, the pixel value here is the average of the four pixels around, and this is what you will get, OK? Uh, and, uh, uh, and there are, you know, I mean, if you, you know, want to, to put your own smoothness conditions, you don't need to follow this Laplacian. You can put uh, other weird things and, and uh, uh, you can test them. Uh, by the way, the programs again for these things are up. You can, uh, if you have time or when you get time, uh, play with them. So let me do another problem uh, so we can finish with this. And it's called uh, data imputation, right? Everybody who collects data, uh, because they were, they got bored uh, collecting data, being in the lab days and nights. So uh, for some experiments, they forgot half of the data. And they say, oops, they went back, right? And says, you know, all these data are missing. What do we do now? Is there any hope? And you know what? The hope would be go and repeat back the experiments. Or another hope is go and take this class, and maybe you can learn how to actually impute this data. So think the following. Think that we have uh, 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 samples from uh, some 20 dimensional Gaussian, all right? And somehow I uh, hide from you 50% uh, uh, of the data, all right? So this is uh, you know, a 20 dimensional Gaussian, and 50% of the data are hidden. So you can see, for example, uh, if uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is 20 by 20, all right? So you can think, let's say, on this particular row, I have not given you this. Uh, value or that value or that value or that value, etc. Uh, or I'm sorry, in this case, 
I have given you these values, these are the observed values, but everything else on that row is missing. All right? Is missing. So we basically, is there any hope to compute it? Obviously, as a generic problem, right? The, the answer is no, there's no hope. Okay? Now, if somehow uh, you, you know that this is Gaussian, right? Means basically that all the columns are correlated because they are samples from the same Gaussian, right? From the same Gaussian. So can you uh, guess how for each row you can actually go and compute uh, the, uh, you know, the data that are missing, basically, using what is given based on the formulas that we discussed? Remember again, we computed the conditional distribution of xi given xb. So what should I take as xb now? What is given? And xa would be what is a no, all right? And uh, indeed, uh, this is what uh, has been done here. So you can see these are three different rows, okay? And you can see these are the observed data that uh, you know in these rows. Uh, this is the true values of everything that is missing, and this actually is what you compute, okay? And uh, uh, overall, basically, it looks, uh, uh, I mean, there is some points that come very good, but overall, the calculations look extremely good, okay? This problem of missing data, it's fundamental to machine learning, right? So if you, something is missing, it doesn't mean, you know, uh, it's uh, hopeless, you can uh, recover them assuming some structure in the distribution from where the data are coming. I mean, you need to, to make some assumption, and in this case, is, the assumption is that this data come from a multivariate Gaussian. So once you do that, you can actually impute uh, this data. Now, in, uh, uh, in this problem, obviously, you remember, so if I give you the data, right, and I say uh, we're going to compute uh, the way we do this calculation, right, we compute uh, given the visible vari variable, so what I gave you, you compute the hidden in every row, and, and uh, because this, this has to be Gaussian, we take the expectation of that. But uh, here we assume that the parameters of this multivariate Gaussian are known. All right? So, uh, and actually, I believe in the, in the computer program, you may want to check it, the parameters that are being used to do this uh, 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 little plots, okay, are the exact parameters of this Gaussian. So in a real problem, you're not gonna know what those parameters are. So this problem, uh, it will be, before you do data imputation, you're gonna have to calculate the distribution from where the data is coming. And you're gonna have to use whatever is given to you, not what you would like to have. So it's not like you're gonna use the sample mean or the sample variance, you know, so you're going to have to do some uh, MLE estimate, you know, with uh, uh, these uh, observations only, uh, or, you know, as we will see, apply ideas of maximization, expectation, maximization, all the like. Um, actually, I have, uh, uh, so we can actually finish this. I forgot that these slides were there. So let's, uh, I'm going to give you another form of the, of the Gaussian. Uh, uh, so we can, uh, uh, you know, done with sort of uh, uh, this uh, different versions of presenting a Gaussian. So the form that we have seen up to now, right, is uh, basically in terms of uh, uh, the mean and the covariance. But we, you remember in the exponential, uh, uh, exponential family, we don't play with moments, we play with uh, the canonical variables. All right? So I want to explicitly give you, so that you can at least know that they're there, that this is one representation of the Gaussian, and other representation, the canonical, involves uh, the variables lambda and xi. Lambda is the precision, the way we know it, and xi is sigma minus one mu, the mean. Okay? So, uh, so uh, this is called the canonical form or the information form of the Gaussian. Rather than parametrizing in terms of mu and sigma, you parametrize it in terms of lambda and xi. And actually, you know, the transformations are straightforward. And the canonical representation looks more complicated, okay? Uh, so there is uh, uh, xi transpose lambda minus one xi and a linear term xi 
and extra spouse lambda x, uh, lambda x, and you may say, and who cares? Well, sometimes, you know what, uh, you may want to guess that uh, the same thing when, rather than using the covariance, we use the precision metrics. Sometimes, when you do algebra, uh, in terms of this canonical representation, the results look way uh, uh, simpler than if you use the moment representation. And you know a typical result of that is when you multiply two Gaussians. If you multiply two Gaussians, what do you get at the end? A Gaussian. So let me, I'm going to jump right uh, to give you the answers. If you take two Gaussians here and you multiply, this is the mean of the Gaussian. And I'm doing this actually in invariant Gaussians, not even complicated. Uh, this uh, mean is this, and the covariance is like that. Now, if you multiply, if you do this in this information form, uh, and you multiply two uh, Gaussians in the information form with uh, precision lambda and this natural parameters C1 and C2, then uh, the multiplication gives you C1 plus C2, lambda 1, lambda 2. Okay? So you can imagine that in certain problems, it will pay off to actually work with this. Okay? Don't, so don't say, ah, you know what? Everybody uses moments. Well, you know, when algebra gets out of hand and you have uh, these products, basically this, w I mean, you may not care this as, an, you know, f as a final result, but maybe you do all the intermediate calculations like this, and when you are done, and you say, here is the answer, OK, in, in a moment form. So um, I, I basically. Uh, uh, I revisited some of the results I, uh, that uh, we saw before. So, uh, you know, we had these uh, marginals. Uh, so I give you the marginal in information form, if you like. And I believe I gave you also the conditional, or maybe I drop it out, uh, and the conditional also in information form. So when you do these partitions and you want to see how the condition distribution looks in information form, uh, it's, a, it's a, a way more simplified, basically, than what we have seen before. And the marginal, the marginal was already very simple, right, in the moment form. Obviously, you're not going to take something simple and make it more simple. There's no such a thing. So you're going to take something simple and you're going to ruin it. OK? All right. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do on uh, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, basic things about uh, uh, hierarchical prior modeling that's in the homework, OK? And then uh, a little bit of an informative prior, so I think we already have discussed it, but uh, way less formless tomorrow, but uh, also this hierarchical Bayesian modeling, uh, there is some depth there, so we will uh, hopefully do something tomorrow, okay, if we survive. All right, so I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, the spies are everywhere. That's yeah. how I felt. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt when I was in China. That's yeah. What, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to see. All right, here.